Hey guys, happy Sunday. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, yeah, it's Sunday <laughs> again, two weeks after. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Hi guys. Hope everyone's doing well. Can everybody hear us okay? Uh, just write something in the chat. Just want to make sure that we are heard loud and clear. So we'll see. We'll see, there's a little bit of delay here. Give us a, a radio check <laughs> on uh, channel 16. That's right. All right. I think we're good. Yeah? Does yeah. it look okay? Yeah. Should we start? Should we get going? Yeah. I just want to make sure people hear us. It's your turn again. I mean, you're leading those things. I, yeah. I don't do much. I just, That's I'm, not hanging true. Out, I'm hanging out in the chat taking questions. <laughs> And yes, Ryan was uh, definitely doing his hair five minutes before we started. That's why, that's why we were never really active during the first five minutes. It's because Ryan is making sure he looks good. <laughs> Something like that, I ah, suppose. Ah, it's so many people. Hi, Sunny. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, guys. It's good to see you. Man, it's actually a lot of, uh, it's a lot of people. Yeah? Already. Yeah. That's great. Woohoo! Well, I mean, today we're going to talk about boat maintenance in general sense and boat maintenance can be such a wide variety or a wide of wide variety a wide range of topics that can go way down into the rabbit hole on one or we can keep it high level so we'll we have a bit of a presentation like always and we'll see where the comments and questions kind of go uh, and kind of guide us but Maintenance for me, I would say was probably, and Sophie can back me up here, uh, was probably the most stressful thing when we, when we got to the, like when we bought our boat. Wouldn't it's hard say? to know what to do. And it's a little bit overwhelming because it's so much and you don't know what you don't know, right? Exactly. And yeah. it's so many different systems. You know, when you when you get a boat, it's not only about the sails, it's also learning about electric systems and toilets and piping and woodwork and teak and gel coat. It's yeah. it's so many different things that all of a sudden you need to learn about how to take care of them and how to repair them when they break. Um, yeah, it was a bit woo. Absolutely. Like and I would say I would say from my perspective, like the sailing is almost the easier part when you first got the boat. It was it was just like a lot of things and that made me really frustrated. So hopefully this uh, presentation will help some of the new people out and maybe give a little bit different perspective. Uh, on things and we're going to tell some stories along the way. <laughs> Lots of <laughs> Which, uh, life lessons. Life lessons <laughs> as we go. So, um, well, let's dive in. So today we're going to go over just a few, few fun things. Uh, so we'll, like high level, we're going to talk about, well, first off, how fun maintenance is, which so we all know. Fun. Yeah. Some different ways to plan your maintenance. Uh, oh, we've lost the, we've lost the PowerPoint. There we Oopsie. Go. Some different ways to plan plan your maintenance uh, and maintenance schedules. So we'll we'll show you some examples of what we have on Polar Seal and how we do a bit of our maintenance planning. Uh, we could probably be a bit, little bit better about that, but uh, most of it's up in my head, <laughs> which yeah. is always the best place. And I mean, a lot of time you guys come up with uh, really good input too. So this is very much interactive and this is uh, the reason why we do those lives is because we get to, uh, to talk to you and also take your inputs. Um, share them. By no means we're experts. No, definitely not. We are not maintenance experts, but we're just sharing our experience of well, what we've experienced in our four years of this. So uh, maintenance schedules uh, are best tips and lessons learned. We'll do those along the way as we go. Um, and then also talk about some things we wish we knew when we started. Uh, some costs that we've experienced. Uh, again, that's gonna vary in everybody's situation and then some Q and A. So first lesson learned it's okay to be overwhelmed sometimes. <laughs> and I really did not understand this uh, when, we first, when we first started out. I really didn't understand. I thought everybody had it under control and that I was just the only one that didn't. In fact, when we first bought our boat, I, would, I remember watching an episode of La Vagabond and they were doing some maintenance on a winch 
when they were crossing the Atlantic and they had it all torn apart and there's pieces everywhere. And I said to myself, I have no idea what that is. I don't even know what a winch is really. Like, how am I gonna know how to take that thing apart and like fix it while I'm at sea? And I'm like, am I expected to do that? And so like immediately I was just overwhelmed. So let alone the fact that I've never moored a 40 foot boat. I now need to like figure out how to take this big metal thing off. It's probably really expensive and fix it. So that was, that was the first bit. And I, that's why I say again, it's okay to be overwhelmed. And in fact, that photo of me there is a, it's a photo recently of when we were installing um, our new water maker panel and we had like a massive explosion with stuff. And while well, we had just crossed the Atlantic, it only been a few days later. So I was tired and well, that's me after being super soaked by our water maker. I don't think you were very happy with me taking those photos. I don't think I was very happy and that's <laughs> probably the look. But yeah, uh, I think that many times we've talked about this, especially when you're in the middle of your frustration that, you know, it's probably everybody goes through that. Yeah. Not. And I think that if you get into it knowing that it's going to be frustrating, it's probably going to take you more time than you thought it would, and things are going to go wrong, a lot of time you find new projects when you get into one. And I think that it gets easier as time goes because you just have the experience of those things happening. Would, yeah. you, say, would you say that it's the case? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, it just comes down to experience. So that probably leads us into our next our first thing and that's the easiest thing i can think of when it comes to boat maintenance so instead of worrying about the winch you're worrying about how i'm gonna take care of the rigging or how am i gonna know if something looks right it's just to keep the boat clean that's probably like the most simple basic best advice that i've learned over the four years is by keeping the boat clean and picked up and knowing where everything goes and that everything has a place, it's a lot easier to identify problems. There's a catch you, though. What's the catch? Honey? The catch is that there are so many little nooks and crannies and so many little corners and there is always a cabinet that <laughs> you've never been at the bottom of, sometimes leading to exciting finds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think that keeping the boat clean really enables you to go to the, the bottom of things, literally. Um, but it's also something that's super time consuming because there are so many different places and corners yeah. of the boat. I think specifically though, like I, when I say that, I'm talking about like just big areas of the boat. So the engine compartment's a really good example of this. Um, by keeping the bottom or the bottom of the engine compartment really clean and having it painted white allows a person to see problems maybe quicker than if that compartment was really dirty or didn't have a floor that could identify areas where there's leaks or water coming in or oil leaking out. Uh, and same thing with just keeping the engine paint uh, nice and fresh and also cleaned up. So, so if there, you do have like engine belt debris, if you, you've checked it, it looks good and you wipe it all down after that, you're gonna be able to see how fast that accumulates. And that's, that's a telltale sign. I would say the bilge is also a good place for this. So by keeping that bilge clean and keeping the water out, you're gonna be able to notice a lot quicker, okay, something's not right. We've got like a little bit of water in here. There's some oil that's leaking from somewhere. Um, and that's just like the first place to start. And I've found that that's just been the, the most basic and easiest tip that we could have gone. And I wish I just would have known that earlier. Yeah. yeah, I think that the first thing that we did when we get the boat was to clean absolutely everything that we could find. To this day, we are still finding places that were never clean, never cleaned, which, uh, which is interesting. Terry is saying clean, especially in the engine room. And yes, that's uh, absolutely correct. We're going to go into uh, how often we do checks on board. But the engine is typically one thing that we check before each passage and on a yeah. regular basis. And what we look for are leaks or little droplets of, uh, of things that should not be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that, that engine compartment was uh, a place that we started off. There's something else I was gonna mention too about that. Uh, but anyways, keeping it clean, keeping it tidy. Oh yeah, um, and I, I'm taking this whole live session kind of from a place of getting a new boat to you and maybe it's your first boat. I realize there might be a lot of you out there that have had a boat before and maybe are thinking about 
going off cruising or have a variety of different plans or just want to hear some other people's views on how they look at it. But that's how we're kind of approaching it. So for us, keeping it clean would have been a really good place to start. Uh, I think we did. We did. But uh, if I would have just realized that that was the first step of maintenance, I probably would have been a little less stressed. The other, the other thing too is like, I didn't even know where to start when we first stepped on that boat. Like, I, what does this panel do? What does that panel do? And what I found myself doing was, I think like three or four times a week, I would just go out to the boat and just crawl around in every nook and cranny, every hole, pick up panels, play with switches, follow wires around, just to figure out where they were going, what they did, and then sometimes I'd say to myself, like, well, this doesn't look right, or maybe this is right. Maybe I need to ask somebody. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> so it was like a big discovery process, but it was one that I really had to take on myself. And you were still working at the time, so you didn't really have the opportunity to come out with me. No, and, you spent like, days just staying at the boat and going through everything that was on board. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, did, I did not do that. Yeah. So the, the, I'd say the next thing that we did was, I'm just going to switch the slides here, was since I didn't know, um, since I didn't know where to start other than maybe keeping the boat clean and climbing around in the boat and seeing what was going on, there was one document that we had that gave us a little bit of an outline where to start. And that was actually the survey report that we got from well, the survey that we did on Polar Seal. So in that, there was probably 40 recommendations of things, everything from some uh, very critical things. Like, for instance, we had a block for our traveler that was built in to the fiberglass uh, on top that had cra completely cracked and separated. Uh, that needed to be fixed right away, and that was something that they did before we took delivery of the boat. Uh, but then there was another number of other smaller things like rebedding the aft um, pulpit or putting a protection plate around the heater. These are all things. So that was a really good place for us to start. And I'll just show you some examples. I don't know how well they'll come up here. Um, but in the survey report, you can see uh, there was one about checking the gas line hoses. We didn't know how often those needed to be replaced, but the survey gave us a good place to start. So just saying that we should check those and that they should be uh, replaced every three years. That was, a, I think, a healthy place to start. <laughs> and we did that right away. Uh, fitting some different CO alarms and gas alarms. Yeah, and, and we get also a lot of uh, really good tips from the surveyor that we had hired about um, what things need to be ta taken care mm -hmm. of first and also some tips along the road for you know, what we would need to do to uh, take care of, of that boat. And, uh, Absolutely. How, how big was the survey in total? How many pages did we have? I think that survey in total was almost 50 pages. Mm. Um, and he spent a full day with us on the boat. Uh, this was a guy in the UK that we hired. And it was worth all the money that we spent for him. He yeah. was really good. And the first thing we asked him when we hired him was, can we stay with you the entire time and ask you as many questions as we possibly can to learn. Uh, and he agreed to that. And he was just really awesome and super patient with us. Yeah. So, and that's actually gonna be a tip that we have coming up, which I'll just say now is that take every opportunity that you have- To ask questions. To ask questions and learn. So we've mm -hmm. hired, even though I like to do a lot of work myself, we've hired a number of people over the years just for jobs that I don't feel comfortable with or I'm just not 100% sure on. But what I've always done is stood with those people and made sure that that was okay and tried to learn from them as we went. So hopefully the next time I can do the job or maybe two times down the road, I can do the job myself. Uh, and that's been, that for me justifies the money that we spend on the hired help, I yeah. would say. Yeah. We've gained a lot of time and uh, we've acquired a lot of knowledge just by letting people who know a lot more than us tell us uh, this is how it's done, this is what you should do. And typically we don't hire those people very often, mm -hmm. but in the first steps it's been really, really useful to have people to guide us around, uh, especially when we bought Polar Steel and we had 
no knowledge whatsoever. Yeah, one cool thing our surveyor did, and I'll show you here in the survey report if you can see it, um, is in some of just the normal recommendations and then in the longer report, they really went through. And so this particular section 2.2 is talking about the rudder stock, the cables and how often that should be checked. Uh, same down here, it was talking about 3.1, talking about the stern seal. So this is the seal that goes over the shaft for our propeller. Um, and it's saying it should be vented regularly and should be uh, replaced every five to seven years or 500 hours of service. So for us, that gave us a good starting point without getting into the books, but just an opinion from a licensed surveyor on how often we should be changing these things or checking these things. And so for the first like year or two, it was kind of my manual that I went to to just say, okay, what did our surveyor think about this or how often, should, or did he have anything to say about, <laughs> about this? So, and granted the surveyors can miss things. People have different views on surveyors. I don't even know if I would use a surveyor if we bought another boat, but. Um, it would really depend on the surveyor. I think yeah. that this time we would be extremely picky with who we choose. Yeah. And before hiring a surveyor, I would ask for the type of survey that they provide you with because there are different types of surveys out there. We didn't really know what to expect the first time around. Now I know what to expect. Now I know that a good surveyor will put certain things in its survey. Yeah, and I think, I think um, yeah, there's a few things on that. And we are, I guess we're diving into surveying a little bit, but it is important because one of Sophie's favorite sayings is that when you buy a used boat, you're not buying, um, you're not buying the... Um, you're buying the former owner of the boat. Exactly. You're buying, you're, buying the, the, you're buying the seller of the boat. Exactly. So a surveyor is going to give you a little bit of their own opinion on <laughs> how well that yes. previous owner did. And then so, one day you will end up as Paul Collins and pull up a water pump and find three black wires and one red. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So... Um, Hi, Paul. The other thing with surveyors is, uh, like for instance, the surveyor we had, which I felt was really good, but he would not, if there was any compartments that were sealed, so with screws or nuts or lock, he wouldn't open those compartments. Uh, there are surveyors that will do that. And if I was gonna buy a very expensive bigger boat, I would spend the money to hire that type of a surveyor, one that's actually gonna open the compartments. I mean, one of the reasons they don't do that is because they don't wanna be liable if something breaks or if they're crawling around in the spot. So I would hire somebody to really dive in, open compartments, uh, crawl into the hard spots to get to, even if they're uh, shut with screws. So that's, that's my feeling on that. Mm -hmm. any, any questions right now, honey? No, uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> uh, we installed this brand new bigger alternator and Kevin asked if the engine, the engine belt debris uh, has diminished since we fitted our larger alternator mm -hmm. or what was the impact on? Yeah, so I think, yeah, uh, well, we can just mention that now, um, but we, yeah, definitely. So uh, we, I guess we did talk about it earlier in here, but we fitted a new alternator now before we had a lot of engine, um, well, it wasn't debris, it was belt debris. So the belt was wearing. And that was one thing I could tell in the engine compartment because we did keep it so clean. Uh, and it's just, it has to do with those, uh, the, the V belts that are used and they, they do do that depending on how tight or loose the belt is. And since we put a serpentine belt on, we have experienced almost no belt debris in the engine compartment. Granted, we probably only used it for like- A few hours. Like 20 hours maybe. Yeah, maybe, if that. Yeah, so. And uh, Sayalis asked if we preferred to learning maintenance by doing it or by taking some kind of training about engine electronics. This is a really good question. Um, I don't think I don't think I've given myself enough credit for how much school. So, and I was lucky in the states. I went to a high school that had like every program you could possibly think of. So, I got to take an engine class in high school. I took a electricity class where we actually wired a house. Um, how much of that like was retained in my memory <laughs> uh, is questionable, but um, they definitely helped and I definitely understood the basics, which is good. Uh, 
if you under if you take any if you study human factors at all, learning by doing and trial and error is the best way for like a person to retain the information and use it down the road. But the problem with that method is that it's also the most expensive method, both in time and just in errors. In errors, yes. <laughs> so many times, like, so I do prefer to do it that way. But many times I'll end up going out and buying five different parts because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do this. So in that sense, it costs more or it just costs me a lot of time. But as I just said, I do really retain it and I learn a lot along the way. So I've kind of adopted more of a hybrid way nowadays of working with other people to try to get some, like go talk to other people. Hey, have you ever had this issue? Get a few different opinions on how to do it and then just go forth and conquer. Um, and that seems to have worked fairly well. So it's like a hybrid way. I'm a, if I'm really in trouble, I'll go on the forums, but that's like a million different opinions and it <laughs> sometimes it gets a little scary. So that's, that's what I prefer. If you are just starting out, I would highly recommend taking just a basic diesel engine course. Um, or like a basic electric course, I think that would just help a lot, at least just for the understanding of how the thing is working. And if you understand how it works, it's gonna be easy to, easier to figure out problems. Yeah, that's actually a comment that we had that uh, Terry recommends <coughs> the one day airway diesel engine course or the equivalent. Uh, and I think that's probably all you need. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Unless you really wanna get into the heavy duty stuff or you're gonna start refurbishing engines which we're not going to do. No, <laughs> but we so, know someone who did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, anything else? No. Nope. No? Nope? Okay. So now on just a little bit of the philosophy of boat, and this is a little philosophical bit here, but there's really four methods to maintaining boat maintenance on a boat. Uh, so the, there's preventative maintenance, which is what we describe as a schedule. So you have a schedule and once a week or once a month, you're going to do something, change a filter or change a belt. And it's always going to be once a month, re regardless of you using the boat or not using the boat. This is what you're going to do. It's that schedule. Uh, then you have a, the second one called predictive maintenance. And this is based more on conditions. So I'm using the boat so much, uh, or I've been using it really hard this week, or I know because I've been in salt water, I need to focus on something. And that's more of like a predictive method. Um, then the third method that we talked about is corrective. And that would be, <laughs> that would be the old adage, if, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Now it's broken, fix it. So I think we've all used the correct the corrective method. Yeah, it doesn't work. It's not my favorite. The corrective method <laughs> is no. not your favorite, no. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the last is a risk-based method. So this might be you notice something is maybe starting to wear down, but then you do your own risk analysis and decide, well, okay, if this thing breaks, if it breaks, what's the likelihood of it breaking? And then if it does break, what is the severity of the consequences if that breaks? So maybe it's uh, some type of a hose, it's starting to look a little ratted or like starting to disintegrate. Maybe you just don't have the funds to fix that right now and you do your own risk analysis and say, well, even if it does break, like it's fine. We're like the pump will still work or we don't really need it. And I think that all of us, the reason I'm bringing it up is because all of us use generally a combination of those different preventative philosophies. It's just we're not really aware of it. And some of us use certain ones to a greater degree than others. And that's what changes our kind of view on how to do maintenance. Um, and I have a bit of an example here, but before we get to that, I'm just going to any questions on that so far? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. No. No, okay. Um, so there's that. Um, and then, oh, I've got to switch the slides here. We typically use a, we, we break down our maintenance. So we have our kind of philosophy to maintenance. 
And then we break it down into efforts which are daily, monthly, monthly and yearly. And these all are gonna be dictated uh, differently. So for example, on a daily method, uh, and I'm saying daily as in we're gonna go out sailing daily, um, is that every day before we go out, we will do an engine check. And that's not something everybody does, but that's something that we do on our boat. And that's just very simple. We just open the engine car compartment and because it's clean, we are easy to look in there, see if there's any oil leaks, check the oil level, check the belt tension, check the coolant level, and boom, like that's it. And that's the fastest, easiest way to just avoid problems. Because if we notice that the belt is loose today, but it was tight yesterday, well, maybe there's a bolt loose or maybe something else is going on and we can dig a little deeper. But if everything looks okay, we're good to go. Uh, and I think that's, that saves, saved us a few times. We don't do that every day if we're sitting on anchor, I would say. You do quite a bit when we yeah. sit on anchor too. Yeah, exactly. So there's other daily things if we're on anchor that I might take a lap around the boat and just check random things and, and see what's going on there. But mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Nope. Um, then we have we have monthly and yearly stuff, um, but then there's also differences that are going to pop up. So cruising versus weekend sailing. As cruisers, we use our boat a lot harder than what maybe a weekend sailor will, uh, and that's that's going to have an impact on how we're going to approach maintenance. So you and I, Sophie, are definitely doing a lot more of the like preventative predictive maintenance than yes. we were before we left, wouldn't you say? Yes, there are two aspects to it. I think that you and I, uh, to start with, are a little conservative mm -hmm. and we have a tendency to want to replace things before they even start to look gnarly. Exactly. Yeah. And the second thing is we use the boat extensively and because we've done so many upgrades, we now have so many more systems that we need to look for. Mm -hmm. We have a much more powerful electric system that we need to, uh, to check regularly. We have a water maker, which itself like is a whole other subject of maintenance. Um, we've just upgraded the boat so much that now the boat needs more from us to keep functioning correctly. Absolutely. Um, no, that's that's very true. I think the other thing is, is I'll put the slide back up here. Um, we When we were sailing here in the Stockholm archipelago waters, the water is generally brackish. There's a little bit of salt, but not um, not a lot. And that, that also dictates the growth on the bottom of the boat. So <laughs> that changed our maintenance a lot, I would say, when we got to the Caribbean, that <clears throat> we were not used to having a bunch of stuff growing on the bottom of the boat. And even the Met, it wasn't so bad. But when we got to the Caribbean, like all of a sudden, like <laughs> it was just growing. And that's just from the conditions we were in. So our maintenance had to change based on us being in fresh water or brackish water or the heavy duty salt water of the tropics. Or more so. recently, having to sit on anchor for three months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so going into, I'll just show, this is, this is, uh, this next slide here is, uh, this is from the Yanmar engine manual. And I'm going to show some examples here of preventative and predictive maintenance kind of combined. So the, the manual does a good job of keeping like really telling you all the different checks you should do and the replacements you should do and the frequency of that so that is really a preventative type schedule so it says up here every 50 hours or monthly whichever comes first you should do this daily the daily checks which are exactly what we just talked about um, every 50 hours or so the 250 hours 502 years and then a thousand and four years and generally, we have lived by, I would say, what they prescribe here, which is predictive, um, or I'm sorry, preventative. But from a predictive side standpoint, there's a few things that I haven't followed. And I really do encourage people to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. But there's a few things in here we haven't. So for instance, the um, let's see if I can find it. It's on the next slide. 
on here is the mixing elbow, which is right here. And that's a pretty expensive part, that mixing elbow. So it says, uh, Yamar says that every two years or 250 hours, which with cruising, we could do 250 hours in, well, not a long time if we're trying to get somewhere. <laughs> um, and I'm so engine happy. So um, well, if you're in the med, it's like two days of sailing. No, I'm joking. Yeah, it could be. Uh, so and then to change it every 500 hours. Now, that's a three or 400 euro part, that mixing elbow. And we we take it off every year and check it. And generally, it's pretty good. So even after three years, it's still looking pretty good. Looks generally, we put a new one on four years ago, and it looks almost the same as the day I put it on. So I haven't done that just because we 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 have reached those time requirements, but it's still looking really good. And for me, that's a risk-based thing as well. So that's an example. Um, there's also one down here of replacing all the rubber hoses. So it suggests replacing them every two years or 2,000 hours, which comes first. I think that the hoses on board Polar Seal are original. So we bought the boats 2007, so it's like 13 years. So they're probably overdue, but we do inspect them. It's kind of part of that daily engine check. And they're still looking pretty strong and good. And I know why they recommend it is because that rubber has a life expectancy, a life cycle, and it will des deteriorate and then could cause problems if one bursts or leaks. Uh, but it's in there, and that's something that you can check the manual and then make your own decision about. Again, it's good to follow the recommendations, then also take a look and decide what's going to work for you. I think that you and I, though, pretty much agreed that we were going to change those pipes in the engine and in the galley and probably in the bathroom as well, in head, this year. Yeah, the, I th yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah, I think they're we're, starting to look a little dodgy. I think we we're, know it. I think we're going to go with a big pipe refit this year, which sucks, but um, we're going to do that. Yeah, It's going to be great. Any Anything? On the question box. Uh, we have a few questions, but I feel that we can okay. keep those for the Q&A because uh, today we kept the presentation a little bit shorter than yeah. the last time. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. We can go in the Q&A. Okay, we'll keep rocking it. So, um, life lesson number two. All of, oh, life, all of Ryan's life lessons. Um, and this is asking for help is good. Take the opportunity to ask questions and learn. That's pretty much what I said earlier. This is a photo here of uh, one of our buddies on another boat who was really good with engines and electrical stuff, uh, and we could share a lot of ideas. But he also helped us get our twin head sail up for um, the Atlantic crossing, which was super, super beneficial. But generally, we have every person, as I said before, we every person that we've had on board to do work I've usually hovered over top of them, not to make sure they're doing it right, although maybe that's part of it, but for me to learn as we go. So mm -hmm. that's, been, that's been really good. Yeah, and I think that there are many instances, for example, when we were painting the boat and scraping the boat, when we just didn't know, you know, how far do we need to go? How well does it need to be? And if you don't have someone around you who knows, um, of course, we can Google, but everybody has an opinion. It just it makes so much more sense when you get going to have an expert helping you and mm -hmm. you know kind of holding your hand as you go. Um, so yeah, and also the value of having a second pair of hands on board. And uh, I think yeah. that you and I work a lot. When you work, I know that. You know, I'm yeah, yeah. Sometimes to, uh, you just can't. Hand. Sometimes you just can't get around having that second. No. Yeah, you have to have. And we're going to talk about some specifics later in the presentation, but uh, it's nice to. Uh, it's nice to be too. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Good. So I think we kind of talked about this part in the presentation, but I'll just put it up. Is a little bit of our own schedule. So, we always do a. A, sail, a daily engine check before we go out sailing. And anytime we go offshore, I will usually climb the rig and just check check the rig. And it's it's just a preventative thing. So I go up, just see if there's any any of the um, wires are broken out of the, the ends, or see if something's misaligned, or if there's a bolt loose or something's loose. 
it's the best way. And, and you know, our, our friend Andy Shell on 59 North, they just recently had a boat where they did an inspection uh, before an offshore passage and everything looked good before the, that passage. They landed on an island, just about to go offshore again, went up and uh, something was a little off on the top of the rig. So things can happen pretty quickly, especially when you're offshore. So it's good beforehand to, to go there. And we always do that before going off. And that's kind of considered our daily checks. Uh, and then underway, we really are out looking under anything. We check the bilge once a day, uh, do a big walk around the boat once a day. So that's it. Weekly then, I'm typically, the way I try to approach things is looking on a 10 hour sketch. So I try to do one hour of boat work a day. So that might be 10 hours one day and no hours the next day. But generally, I try to go with one hour a day. And that could be anything from just cleaning something or polishing something to um, actually fixing some hoses or rerunning some wires. Like this is, that's kind of the mantra I try to live with on it. But yeah, it seems to work. It seems to work. And it's about as much time. Seems to work. Apart from the the moments when something blew up at us and we were like, oh, that needed love. <laughs> yeah, but we haven't had a lot of that, to yeah, be yeah, fair. Yeah, those that we had, they, they, were, they were painful. True, yeah. Um, okay. So that kind of brings us into life lesson number three. And that is, <laughs> look for problems before problems look for you or find you. Yes. Um, and in this example, this photo here was one I'm, I'm pretty ashamed of, although I've realized why it happened. And we had done a big lithium upgrade this year, as many of you know. And it turns out that one of the crimpers that we used wasn't crimping uh, 100%. So in that photo, um, and I'll just put it up there again, in that photo, that's actually the bad crimp. And that's a wire that was going from the battery box or from the switch to the inverter. So there's a lot of current running through there. And well, you can see what happened. It, it essentially melted in. Uh, I think my fingers over the part where it actually melted the sheathing over the cable. And it was, I would say, pretty close to starting a fire. So that was something I actually was out just looking for one day and a few things weren't lining up and I heard some sounds and I smelled some stuff and all of a sudden it was there. So I didn't ignore the problem like, no, I'm not smelling anything, it's fine. <laughs> and actually went and was like, something's off. Went digging and we found that. And it, it, I mean, right away I knew it was gonna be probably a day or two of work that I wasn't planning on, but um, yes. it, it is what it is, you know? So that's life, life lesson number th three. Yeah, I think that one thing that we've learned in the four years that we've owned the boat is that the, 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 the least sign that you find that something is wrong, something smells wrong, something looks a little funny or doesn't feel completely safe, there are two things. The first one is that uh, if you don't take care of it, it's always going to be at the back of your mind. And the second thing is that if, there is, if you have the slightest doubt, then something is off. Um, and yeah, as I said, like, it's always going to be at the back of our mind. Like, do you remember the seacock that we changed? We never had a problem. Yeah, with we got a photo of that coming up. We have a photo of that but, coming up. But uh, there are a few things like that where we found a little detail that was off and that led to a problem that was actually much bigger. Yeah, I, you know, I was going to tell a story earlier. That just like tripped my memory because I think part of this is like sharing stories because for me at least that was that was the biggest impact when we started off like well just getting the boat but then cruising was hearing other people's stories because it made me feel like i wasn't alone because uh, it can be really lonely sometimes uh when you're battling problems by yourself in a gross bilge but um when we first got the boat i was trying to do my first just basic engine change so we, we're gonna or service we're gonna do oil change filters and i think the impeller and i mean i've done oil changes before on my car like, I know how to do an oil change. I know it's lefty-loosey, righty-tighty. But the fuel filter, the, the main fuel filter, I was just like, it, it was not coming off. And I was twisting and twisting. I tried to go the other way, but for some reason that didn't work. And then in my mind, I was like, but is this lefty? Like, it's upside down. And <laughs> I spent, you, you remember this, you spent I spent day. two days total, I think, 
fighting with this this fuel filter and I was going online and reading people, oh, it can get stuck sometimes. So if you like pound a hammer in there or pound a screwdriver in there, so I do that. And of course fuels like all the fuel drains out everywhere and you can like get some more leverage on it. So I did that and I'm pulling and nothing's coming off. And I'm at the point where I'm like, oh, I think I'm gonna have to disassemble this thing, take it out and put it in a, a vise so I have enough leverage to get it off. Then uh, luckily we had a, a local handyman, boatman there, Magnus, who runs our marina. And uh, I had actually broken like at least one or two. Uh, three. You yeah, bro you'd broken three of those uh, rubber. The, the, yeah, the filter there. wrenches. <laughs> and he let me borrow like a high tech one. And we, I was talking to him. He's like, Ryan, are you sure you're turning it the right way? And I was like, ah, oh, Magnus, I've tried both ways. You know, he's like, Ryan, just go down and try as hard as you've been turning the way you're turning, go to the other way and try as hard. So I did, and like two minutes later it came off. And I felt so, so embarrassed. And I will never turn that filter the wrong way again. But it was like that first, <laughs> it was the first um, kind of experience, if you remember. Mm, yeah. We've had a few. We've had a few, but that was, that was the first one. And I wanted to make sure I told that story because yeah, a little embarrassing. Okay, anything? Uh, just go on. Okay, so that's that was life lesson three, but back onto our schedule. <clears throat> um, so that we do the daily and the weekly and the monthly, uh, but then we also have a yearly check. And this is normally, we Sophie and I will pick a few big items every year. Before we set off across the Atlantic, we picked a lot of items. <laughs> you picked and a lot of I items. I picked a lot, and so that's when we did big overhaul of our uh, batteries and the, the arch and what else did we do? And the water maker. Um, and then we also did a, a few other things like changing the anchor chain, uh, putting a new anchor on, uh, a few things like that. This year, I think we're going to do, as Sophie said, we're going to focus on uh, a lot of the plumbing. So we're going to, we may install a new toilet. We will see. Not that's a story to come. Uh, so stand by. Uh, but we're definitely going to replace the pipes because we think they are way overdue for that. And then some of the other kind of older looking pipes that may be smelling in the galley. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's not a huge project, although it could turn into a big oh, project. I know, I know. Not definitely, it is definitely going to be a big project. Another thing that's on the list of pipes to change or to have checked is all of our uh, cooking gas system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's been three years since we've changed that and it's time. That's something we learned from our survey report, as we mentioned, but also from, well, just reading different maintenance books and stuff. So that's a big safety thing. So we will change that this year. Uh, last year we had to service a life raft. We'll have to service our flares this year. Um, so all of these things are are adding up. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So that's the, the yearly check. A few other key points on that um, is, well, I think we just kind of said it, is really keep working on maintenance all the time. We probably overdone it with that, I would say. I uh, know because we still had systems blowing up at us or, uh, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't say blowing up, but we, yeah, we've had. We've, we've had, had some issues. We've had some issues. Um, so, but keep working on it or it's all gonna come crashing down at once. Uh, then the other point that we wanted to point out is you should really, it's, it's easy to get focused on like the fun stuff. I'm very guilty of this. So like- What is the fun like stuff? Like for me, the fun stuff is I'm gonna buy a new chart plotter. I'm gonna buy a new radar and ours might work, but maybe not well. And I'm gonna do that. But in reality, I might need to be focusing on more critical systems uh, and making sure that those are really in good shape and maybe spending my time there. So on the slide here, we just wrote critical systems first. And I, I wrote like a few examples of what I think are really good critical systems. So hull integrity, uh, making sure you don't have like a lot of delamination uh, in the hull and that everything's structurally sound. The yeah, that the anti-fall is in place that, you know, a lot of time people will use, we use a snubber to mm -hmm. uh, hold our anchor and the snubber has a tendency to um, chafe around the hull and remove yeah. the anti-fouling. And that is a part that is particularly sensible to uh, 
you know, growth and critter and getting a bit mat all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, so those are places where it's important now and then to just go over and, and typhoon a little more. Uh, in the hall, one critical part is the through halls. Yeah, the through halls exactly above a photo of that in a second, but checking that. Um, the rigging and the sails, the steering systems are a big one. And I, I don't know if we spend enough time with that or if anybody does, because part of the part of the reason with that is a lot of those systems are hidden. They can be really hard to access. And then we unconscious in our unconscious kind of get into this position where it's out of sight, out of mind. So you might think about, oh, I should check that steering system, but oh, I don't really see it, so screw it. It's probably okay. <laughs> but I it think, is something to, yeah. to pay attention to. There are a few telltales for when you really need to be thorough with your steering system. And we, we run into that issue. One is the game that you have with your steering. Yeah. And there isn't a lot of talking about that, not on the internet, not everywhere. There are actually very few people that know exactly how much game is okay to have and different boat makers have different, you know, like the, steer the steering wheel is more or less uh, stiff. Uh, and one thing that we did when we were when the boat when the boat was hauled out is just to check the rudder, you know, like shake the rudder a little bit, uh, because the bearings of the um, steering mechanism need to be changed every ten years, I don't know. approximately. Everyone's got a different view on this. Yes. So. But th those are also telltales of when you need to, uh, like how to check that your s steering system is okay. If you have a feeling that it's not okay, it's worth double checking and shake the rudder a little bit. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, but one thing I think that's worth pointing out in this here is there's, just, there's maybe a few things you might think are missing and like, I don't have the engine on here. And the, while the engine is important, you need to keep it up, you, it's a sailboat. So you don't need an engine to sail a sailboat. Um, and th that's my point. Don't, if you get focused on just always taking care of the engine and nothing else, there's actually more critical systems in that engine, at least in my opinion. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, well, that's just the point there. Anything else, son, you wanna say? Nope. Okay. Life lesson four. I don't know if I bring my, you can kind of still see it with me there. Okay, life lesson four. Any, <laughs> oh, this is so true. Any project will cost two times as much and take th three times longer than you plan. It's super frustrating. It's what got me the most frustrated when we started. And yeah, that was because I had a plan in my head. We're gonna go out, we got two hours to get this done. Oh, it's been two hours. I haven't even got the first bolt out to do what I need to do. Ugh. And I think, I think a good story for that was um, the first year I did try to service the winches. Uh, it turned out that the last winch I was servicing, when they placed it on the deck, they used a whole bunch of silicone and Sickleflex and like matted it on the deck so that water wouldn't like leak into the screws. But that also prevented me from picking the winch off the deck, which I had to do in order to service it. <laughs> And that led to like a two day job of me trying to like chisel the thing off the deck just so I didn't hurt the, the gel coat uh, and the fiberglass underneath, but I was also able to like crack it and break it through. And that was so frustrating because all the rest of the winches I did in like a couple hours each, but that one winch took two extra days. And I don't know if you remember, I came home and I was just like, oh, this, I didn't know what to do. No, yeah, was... there's, been, there's been a lot of frustration. <laughs> but now you know, and it, that's like, you just add every little bit to the your own personal knowledge toolbox as you go. So now if that happens, I, I know exactly what I need to do to, to do that. But it is frustrating. And I think I sh I'll put up the picture again. Um, this photo is actually of us, me. Um, we were replacing two of our through hauls before we crossed the Atlantic. And this particular one is for the engine and it's uh, it's got a little strainer on it that faces backwards. And uh, so the rest of the through hauls were really easy. I could just grind them down, they fell off and you just pop it out. Uh, it took maybe five minutes. This one, 
was not the case. Uh, there were some screws inside the boat that I could take off and maybe try to hammer it down. But those, those screws that were on this through haul were so big uh, that I couldn't find a wrench big enough to, to take it off. I think we did eventually find a wrench, but it, it just didn't work. So uh, that's me with a Dremel tool. That was my fix. And I spent probably two hours down there grinding that, <laughs> grinding that thing off. Uh, and it, it worked. I eventually got it off. It took a little bit of time. It took a lot of time. Yeah. But sometimes you just have to have patience because, yeah, it's something that, yeah, as, uh, as our Dutch globetrotter said, a five minutes project can turn into a five day refit very quickly. Oh, yeah. Super quickly. Something that's very common and that happens more than we um, dare admitting it is that while you're trying to repair it, repairing or maintaining something, it breaks or you yeah. will break something else in the process. And now you not only have to complete your project, you have to repair what you broke in the process, which uh, has happened to us a lot and mm. happens to a lot of people. And yeah, I think that, you know, we're telling those stories because when we got started, we we felt extremely bad about it. We felt that we felt like enormous failures and we would come home at night and and really beat ourselves up about it. And uh, so the message is, if you're new to this and you don't feel like you're a failure because the learning curve is really steep. It's many, many different systems that are all weird and complicated in their own way. And we all had big screw ups. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that took me a, a while to figure out, realize and get. Uh, but once once I got that, I just felt like so much more comfortable. And I think as time went on, um, I just got more comfortable with our boat and the system. So look, right now, I'll, I have no problem as long as I'm really confident in it. I don't think we have the picture in the slide deck, but taking a drill or a big saw and just start hacking into something if I know. And if the first year, if I would have done that, I would have had like <laughs> two days of massive head stress. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to cut into this. Is that okay? Like, I don't know. It's going to cause some crazy problem that I made up in my head. And that's just my like millennial anxiety, I guess. <laughs> Did but, you uh, call yourself a millennial? I'm, I'm not really a millennial. You're I'm a like, little too old for that, honey. I know, I'm, I'm like sorry in a special, to, I'm sorry to say. special, special, anyways. Okay. Carrying on, we're getting sidetracked. Uh, so some practices that we have found useful for maintenance. First is buy a book, buy a maintenance book. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Nigel Calder's book. I think most people who are on here listening probably have that. If you don't have it, it's really what I would say is like kind of the boat maintenance Bible. I have a few other ones that are really good. Sophie has a couple just basic engine books that she can reference if she's trying to figure out something. But uh, that book has really helped us. There's a, I think in some areas it's getting a bit outdated, but uh, it's generally really good and will point you in the right direction of pretty much anything you're trying to deal with on the boat. Yes, and I think it's something that we never really thought about when we had the boat at the dock and we were weekend sailors before we started mm -hmm. to full-time cruise. But having a book when you cruise is indispensable in the sense that you don't necessarily always have access to internet and YouTube and uh, online resources. And a book is such a nice place where you know that you can always go to when, when you, when you want to figure out something. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I was going to make a comment to that earlier, but like I've, I've kind of been mixed like, so the book is, yeah, a good source, but I'm, I'm a bit personally like mixed on how I want to handle my manual. So, you know, everything you buy comes with manual. And uh, for the really critical stuff, so for our engine or the winches or uh, just any of the critical items, I feel, I usually have them printed and I have them in an electronic format on one of the laptops or on a drive. Uh, and then for most other things, I'll typically just ditch it because it's a lot of weight on the boat and then I would just keep that all electronically. Uh, but I do try to keep a file, so I don't need to have the internet to do that, but it's a good place just to reference it. So critical stuff I keep printed, I keep in a big binder, uh, or I keep the manual that it came with and the rest, and that kind of falls into the whole book thing, I would say. So the book, the book piece is good, but YouTube is also your friend, and I have learned so much from YouTube. I hope that 
you guys on YouTube have learned a bit from us uh, because that's something important for us is just to share some of our knowledge and experience. A and yeah, you can pretty much type in YouTube for anything <laughs> and you will find a how to or how to fix it. So it's, it's really good. So clearly you're on YouTube, so you know how to use it right now, but we just want to put that. Uh, keep a detailed log and all the receipts. And I have to say, this is something that I have not been good at. I wanted to be good at this, but I wanted to just have a big maintenance log where everything I did, you write it down the day, even if it's just changing a screw or a bolt. And we have friends that have uh, a used catamaran and the previous owner did that and they showed it to me and it's so awesome because they can literally just go back and check and say, okay, it was changed on this day. Here's the receipt for it because it, the owner kept all that. And this is where it was purchased from and this is the make and model of it. It's just so useful. So I do keep a lot of things, I keep all the manuals, but I really do wish I had a log and even more so, and I'm sure some of you wish I did this too, but um, I have played around with trying to get a good Excel sheet together with dates and stuff. So it will even give you warnings on when things need to be updated, but I haven't finished that project and it could be some time. So don't ask me for that, but maybe if we get that done sometime, I'll <laughs> put that up. We'll uh, see. Talking, talking about maintenance and big projects, do you know who, ju who just joined the chat? Oh, who's that? It's, uh, I don't know if it's Mike or Spencer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from uh, Alamar Centro. Yeah. Uh, Marino, I don't remember the word in Spanish, <laughs> but uh, it's the Chandlery in uh, Almery Mar where we spent a lot of our time in 2019. Yeah. And we did a lot of projects. And that Chandlery is, I think, one of the best. Yeah, they were really good. We'll put it in a little plug for those guys. But if you if you need to do a big re boat refit and you're in the med, go to Almir Mar, the marina's cheap, and the guys at the uh, the chandlery there are really awesome. And yes. we talked we talked a bit about um, in, earlier in the live about how uh, it's it's good if you can have somebody on board and then kind of follow them and learn from them. And those guys let let us do that every time. And yeah, we've learned we, we learned so much from them. They're super helpful. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. Carry, okay. <laughs> carrying on. Um, yeah, you will never be done learning is the next tip. Uh, and that can it be anything for the, from the truth. We learn stuff every single day. In fact, we were, I was on a boat, uh, yes. Well, when a couple of days ago, it was a Oceanus 40, just like ours, but it's a three cabin. And, um, the, the owner of it was trying to, I was, well, I was trying to light the oven. Uh, and he's like, no, no, you can turn the knob left or right. Cause it has a top burner and a bottom burner. And I was like, what? <laughs> what does it? And I'm like, Sophie, do we have a top and a bottom burner? Like, don't, we don't do not. apparently we don't, but I wouldn't have even noticed that to begin with. So, um, never stop learning. Uh, back to this, use the correct tool for the job. Uh, and this also goes with set prepare for the job correctly as well. So I know in one of our first slides, we had a, we were talking about a list of tools to carry on board. Uh, we have that list done. We're going to get it online. It took me a while to, to put it together, but it's going to be on our, our website soon. But using the correct tool for the job is so important. It makes it so much easier because you think that you're saving yourself time by just using a basic knife or something instead of actually using wire strippers or doing something else. It is, it, in the long run, it saves time. And then same thing with the preparation. And I think most of you who do your own DIY projects and same with us, the preparation usually takes like 70% of the time for the project. And that's usually where you find other problems, like the bolt won't come out or something else is broken or you broke the plastic piece covering the thing that you're trying to fix. Then you gotta fix that. So understand that that is, almost the bigger project and that the usually the maintenance or the fixing of whatever is typically the smallest bit that's what i've learned at least uh and then the last well that is the last point take your time with preparation so that's what i've learned uh from that so yeah okay so last and i know this will be a question for a lot of you is our cost what like what what does it cost for us? So generally the rule of thumb is 10 to 20% operating cost of the haul value. So if your haul is $100,000, that's what you paid for it. You can expect between 
10 and 20 thousand dollars a year in operating costs now that would include like fuel uh, maybe marina fees and whatnot but the majority of that is going to be maintenance things so oil filters things that break um, it, and generally speaking i think sophie that we would find that to be a fairly true statement like 10 to 20 percent the operating yes, cost always we uh, made a series of video about the cost of ownership on the different types of sailboats yeah uh, we interviewed a couple of friends of ours and ourselves, and we compared the cost of maintenance of a, um, a 77, 28 or 30 foot yeah. uh, catch, a super old, very, very simple boat with the cost of our maintenance. And we did a uh, more or less detailed calculation of how mm -hmm. much it costs to maintain policeal. And then the cost of maintaining a 2015 ML, 54, beautiful boat. And obviously, the, the numbers vary vastly. Yeah. Um, but typically, that's, uh, they say that, yeah, it costs around 20% of the whole value. 10 to 20, yeah. And that's, that's what I found. Um, but just to give you some other ideas of what we spent, usually for our basic er engine servicing, so this would be changing the oil uh, and the filters, that runs me about 100 to $150. And that also depends on where in the world you are and how readily available the parts are. So I usually carry a stock of those with me because I just never know. Um, if you're going to do like a more thorough change, that would be changing the impeller, changing the uh, coolant in there. That It's going to be maybe double that just because there's a few more things to buy. Uh, and then I usually plan on about $300 a month for just a kind of other parts and services. So this just may be random things that break. Uh, or things, you know, you're walking through a chandlery. This happens to me a lot. I'm walking through the chandlery and I'm like, oh, they have this part that I have been looking for for two years. I'm just going to buy a bunch of those now and that, that costs a bit. So we usually plan on that in the budget. And that's kind of our daily, monthly cost for that. Um, then we have refits. And we, as we said, we try to do about a refit uh, a year, depending on where we're going and what we're doing. Although Polar Sea is kind of maxed out now, so now we're going back. But we or... still have a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. And, exactly. You know, systems get old. Um, so yeah, typically the electric system was one. We knew that the batteries were reaching the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. And instead of just uh, replacing the batteries, we uh, opted to upgrade them and go lithium. Yeah. And I think that this year we're going to do the same thing with the toilets. I'm working really hard on this to change the toilet. And instead of uh, changing the whole toilet, which is uh, it's old, the pipes need to be changed. I'm going to try to install an electric toilet, which I'm very excited Stand by. About. Stand by for that, uh, <laughs> that fun project. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that a lot of time we combine maintenance with upgrades. Yeah, exactly. We kind of do. We kind of do both. So. This is just an example of some of the costs. In 2019, we did about 20,000. That was, that was when we were in Almiramar. And that was with the batteries, the water maker, our solar arch, and the solar. And that sounds like a bunch of new stuff, but in the process, we were taking care of a lot of other things. So we had the, the whole aft pulpit off, or push pit, I guess. We were fixing gel coat problems while we had that off. We were crawling around underneath the boat uh, doing a little bit of electrical work, maybe taking out some old wires. So while we were refitting those things, we were doing other preventative maintenance on things. And because we were crawling around the boat, we were catching other things. Uh, 2018, we, when we, it's actually 2017. I'm not sure why I had it 18. We did, when we first got the boat, we did about 5,000 in the standing rigging and the running rigging, which was big. And um, we just, Wanted to do that. We knew the insurance company was going to require us to have it done because it was over 10 years old to cross the Atlantic. But um, yeah, that's we wanted to do to do that. Um, then you can see here we had some emergency repairs. So this year, oops, this year some of you might rem remember that we had a bit of diesel bug coming down to Cape Verde. Uh, so we had a uh, contaminated fuel essentially, and we had to drain all the fuel out, pull the fuel tank out, get that all cleaned up, clean out the lines. And that cost us, luckily Cape Verde, the labor was 
like fairly affordable. So it was a couple hundred dollars that that, that cost us. And it, we saved a bit of money because I did a lot of that work myself. We could have had somebody come on board and move everything and pull the tank out, but I did most of that. I'd never done it before, um, but the process went the process went pretty smoothly. And the guys down there have seen it a bunch of times. They get a lot of dirty fuel from other places, so it was a good place, I guess, to get the, have that happen before we cross the Atlantic. Uh, but that was about hundred bucks. Then this year. Uh, we haven't really had, I would say, a lot of breakages on the boat. We've been pretty, we've been so diligent about our maintenance that we usually are on top of stuff good. But this year, um, we got to Antigua and we were, went to, we just were beating the sun and we were trying to get on anchor before the sun went down. And literally, it was just about down and pulled up, went to drop the anchor. I had my foot in the anchor locker, the other foot was standing out push the button, nothing happened. It's like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden I felt this thing like hitting my leg. We do it, I, it's like, what is that? And I looked down and now it's getting dark, so I'm having trouble seeing. And I realized it's the motor for the windlass underneath and it's actually spinning around underneath. So instead of the, the capstan turning, it's the motor spinning around. And I was like, oh, that can't be good. <laughs> so I uh, went and got a flashlight went up there and turns out that the whole gearbox, which is made of aluminum or aluminum, as the Americans say, uh, had completely corroded away. It was like sand down there. It, was, it actually acted as an anode and just dissolved itself and can explain why later. But uh, because of that, it had com completely disattached and was just spinning around. So Sophie and I had never, lifted or lowered the anchor by hand. In fact, we had just upgraded the anchor, so now it's even heavier, so 25 kilos plus the chain. Um, and we had to do everything manually, so all of a sudden we were in a position where we needed to buy a new motor for the windlass, which was gonna be somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000, which was a bit of a... A downer! <laughs> that was a hard one. So um, it was really impressive to see the the metal, this enormous, very solid piece of metal flaking away. The thing was completely disintegrating. It was like, Poop. Yeah, it really was. And you know, um, I have to say, we I, or I contacted Quick about this. It's a Quick Windless, and they were super awesome on getting back to me and trying to help me understand what the problem was because. Just because you fix it doesn't mean the problem is away. I really wanted to understand why that happened so that maybe if I installed the next one, we could avoid that. And they explained to me that it was a way that Beneteau had requested the windlasses to be installed. So they wanted all the wires to go through a single pipe and into the windlass, which I guess would cut down on production time to install that. The problem was is that wasn't a waterproof, watertight connection. So over the years when that anchor locker fills up with salt water when it's on the ocean, salt water gets into that connection, goes in there, and because there's electricity, when the anchor chain and the anchor goes down, touches the ground, it creates an earth, and it was causing that aluminum piece to act as an anode and it dissolved, uh, and that's why it failed. <laughs> so, so the question is, what should we have done for that not to happen? Yeah, and what I th did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? And that goes back to a statement I made earlier, which was out of sight, out of mind. And that that motor is in the inside the anchor chain locker, which itself is far away. It's at the bow of the boat, which is yeah. a place that we are we're never there. Right. It's there. Well, you're there to drop it, and you look down there, and you can see things. But that motor and that gearbox is underneath, you know. Uh, some type of a ledge. So to really get down there and inspect it, you have to lay on your tummy, <laughs> put your head on there, shine a light to see what's going on. And there's parts of it you can't even see. So I think for us, what I've learned is I need to go down there more regularly, just put my head under there, look around, poke at stuff, see what's going on. Uh, and and I think that that would have helped us get on top of it because I would have noticed like, man, this is just isn't looking right. To be fair, uh, I did notice over the years that there was a lot of like white calcification, I guess you could say, on it. I don't know. 
Uh, it looked like it was just salt debris all over it. And I thought, because I don't know any better, that that was just from salt getting on there over the years because it's not a waterproof locker. And that was just salt deposits. Uh, and I tried to scrub it off a number of times, didn't come off, so I was like, well, I guess that's just how they look. But in reality, what was happening is that gearbox was disintegrating. I know that now, now you know that. <laughs> this cost us about 2,000 bucks, and I hope that it does not cost you 2,000 bucks <clears> because that was an expensive lesson learned. At the end, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to say at the end of the day it's just money because that was a lot. It's it pretty expensive, really, yeah. It really hurt us. Um, but um, yeah, I, I hope that this does not happen to you. So, what should we have done? Should we have rinsed the windlass with fresh water? No, the, the what thing, should we have done? the thing is, nothing would have nothing would have prevented that. It was an issue with how that motor was constructed. So we would have needed to take that off and kind of maybe reseal that in a different way. Um, uh, quick, quick, when they responded to me about this, said that they knew that this was a problem. It's been a known problem. Um, and they were, they were actually really awesome trying to help me find the cheapest solution to get us back underway so they were, they were really awesome, but I think in reality, the damage was done probably before we even got the boat, Oh, I, I would say, yeah. Uh, Alien had a really good point <coughs> and said that everyone will lube a regular winch, but most people completely ignore lubing the anchor winch. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people kind of ignore the... Did we do that? The windlass. No, I've, I've always lubricated the windlass, and that's on my yearly maintenance list, but I never went underneath to check it. So while I was taking everything apart and thinking, oh, I'm so good, this is never going to fail. Meanwhile, underneath the, the damage was being done. So again, it was a bit of out of sight, out of mind on my part. Boo. Lesson learned, you can learn from my mistakes. <laughs> um, so that's just a little bit of our maintenance stuff. I didn't get into the, the like nitty gritty on how to do certain things because those are how-to videos. And we'll, over the years, we'll, we'll make We'll make videos, Sophie's wandering around behind me. Um, we'll make videos on how to do different things or if people have requests on how to do different things. But um, that was kind of a high level thing. Uh, so I think we'll probably have some questions, but Sophie is in the middle. I'm changing of doing my battery. A small, <laughs> a small technical thing. So maybe in the meantime, do you have a list of questions here, honey? Uh, Yes, I do. Uh, someone asked, what are the must-haves on board for maintenance? I do not remember the name of this person, but... What are what? the must-haves? And so I, I wouldn't say that the must-have is a tool, but the must-have would be a process to check. Check yeah. your boat regularly, like have it down, have your process nailed. Yeah, I think having, like coming up with a process for your maintenance is a good thing. Um, some of the must-haves I have is well, the tool, for me, having the right tools on board is super important. Because if you don't have those right tools, you're just not going to be able to do different things. And that's why I think the tool list I put together is a good place to start. I mean, obviously, everyone's going to have a different opinion about what's right to have on board and what's wrong. And that's, that's okay. But uh, for me, having those tools on board. The other thing is just to have all the maintenance manuals because... I would say 80% of the time, the manuals, depending on how they're written, are just a really good place to, to start. Uh, and they'll probably answer your question. So if there's a schematic in, in there, you're gonna have a good, like, good place to start in terms of maybe how to fix that windlass or how to fix that winch. Uh, so those, the right tools, the manuals, and um, just having a good philosophy, I think about it, are good places to start. Yep. Uh, I think that you also have a very interesting way of thinking about, you know, what tools you need. And it's, if you ever need a tool more than once or twice, buy it. A lot of times you will borrow tools. Yeah. Uh, and I know that, for example, this huge crimper yeah. that you borrowed from uh, Spencer at the Chandlery. You turned out that we needed we needed that uh, crimper more than twice, and yeah. at the end of the day, you ended up just buying it. And I think it's a pretty good philosophy. Yeah, I kind of I heard I read that somewhere once. It's like if you're going to use a tool more than twice, in terms of like borrowing it, just just buy the tool. Uh, and now I've gotten to the point where I 
buy, I buy probably just most of the tools right off the bat. So if I'm like, uh, I need this tool, <laughs> I just go and find it because it's, it's sometimes just a lot easier than trying to go out and borrow. But there are little specialty tools here and there that are just crazy expensive that if somebody has, it is worth borrowing. borrowing. So that's my philosophy with the tools is I just tend to buy it. And I think some of that depends on if you're going to do weekend or just coastal sailing where you're not maybe living on board the boat and you might have better access to places that you could rent tools or buy maybe friends on land that you can get them. But with us living on board the boat and doing almost all of the work ourselves, I found that if we just have a big selection of tools and we have the space to store them, that it's worked out better and been a little bit of a time saver for us. Yeah. So another question that we had uh, was really good. Sony asked, uh, what is the system that you think is the worst to maintain or the most complicated to learn? The most complicated to learn. Okay, what was the most complicated for me to learn? The toilet. No, the toilet was pretty easy. Uh, I actually think the engine for me was pretty easy just because I had taken some classes when I was younger and I understand, I understood the mechanics of how, how an engine works. So diesel engines are pretty straightforward and easy. I think the thing that was the most complicated, even though I'm pretty good at it, was the electrical system. So when you get a new boat, it's going to be like, it's just going to be a nightmare trying to figure out where wires are running. I've been, I've visited a few, a few friends in Stockholm here have been trying to buy new boats in the last month. So I've been out on a lot of different boats looking at them, looking at all the different systems and the wiring is just like the one thing that is inconsistent on everything. So you might know how generally electrics works, but then getting onto a boat and figuring out what the heck is going on is, is such a massive project. And again, I find it so funny because we're talking about sailboats, but for the most part, the sailing mechanism on the boats are like pretty straightforward. You got a sail, you got some, you got some lines that hoist the sail and reef the sails and sheets to control them. But you can, you can understand that pretty quickly and see if it's good or not. It's, it's all the systems below and the more complex we make it, the more difficult it is. So I would say the electric system, at least for me. But that's yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Then there is the um, maintaining the toilet, which uh, is not a, it, it's not a pleasant thing to do. That's not pleasant, but it, it's not complicated, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. It really is. It's just pretty gross. It's just some valves and plunger and stuff. And shit. It's just gross, but yeah. No, I think that's that. Yeah, the electric system, I'd say by far, because like the water systems and the pumps, like it's pretty straightforward. You just follow the pipe around, but the electric systems can be a little confusing. Yeah. All right. So while I was changing the battery of the secondary camera and uh, also <laughs> fixing our focus issues, yeah. because this is a this is a budget production, right? <laughs> like we're not using super mega fancy. But we're trying. We're, we're trying. trying. We're trying yeah. really hard. Um, people had questions about the windlass. Um, so okay. Sailor Wild asked if we renewed the wiring of the windlass. And Dave asked if the new windlass had, like the new windlass had addressed the problem of longevity. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the new windlass did address the problem that was originally there. So quick, the way they designed their windlasses, um, each wire has its own uh, waterproof plug that it goes through into the actual windlass itself to power it or control it. Um, and so that was there, and that's how they've always designed windlasses. In the case of what we had on our Beneteau, it was just a single pipe. It was just a rubber pipe with those three wires in, and it was just one big um, metal ring around to tighten it, to clamp it, and it's just not waterproof. So they, that was addressed. I don't think that they're doing that anymore on Beneteaus. I could be wrong. Um, so that was there. What was the other part of that question? Sorry. If uh, the changing the windlass addressed the issue for longevity. Yeah, but there was the first part. Oh, if we renew the wiring of oh, the okay. windlass. Yeah, we didn't renew the wiring. So the wiring was all okay. I think I stripped off a new piece of it just to expose some more bare wire. I did have a long conversation with Quick because what we did, 
We had a few options with the windlass. The, the capstan on top was still good and Quick advised me that they actually made that capstan out of um, bronze, which they don't do anymore. Most of them are made out of uh, aluminum or stainless. So he really recommended we keep that because it's going to last it's going to last forever. So we did. Um, and then we could have just replaced the gearbox below, but then when he, I sent some pictures to them, they, he saw it and said they recommended we replace the whole motor and gearbox section. So what we did is bought a whole new kit, and in that kit we actually upgraded, so from a 1,000 watt windlass to a 1,500 watt windlass. And we had a long discussion if the cable sizing was going to be sufficient enough to meet um, you know, voltage drop and make sure it doesn't overheat. Uh, and Quick felt that it was sufficient, and uh, I did as well. So we just left that cabling in place. Uh, we did change the solenoid box that controls it, and it was pretty funny because when I showed Quick the picture of what we had in place because that was still working, <laughs> his response was, that should have stopped working years ago. I can't believe it's still working. You need to replace that. <laughs> so they made, some, they made some upgrades on it, but their customer service is great. So. Yep, we didn't replace the cables, but uh, I think we've addressed everything and hopefully I installed it correctly and it lasts until we are done with Polar Seal. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see when we go back to the boat in uh, November, hopefully. <clears throat> yep. How, what's the state of our brand new windlass? Uh, Harold are, had a very good question about um, production boats if they differ much in maintenance or they're pretty similar these days, some a same age assumed. I haven't heard of, so we have a number of friends with different production boats, varying ages from older than ours to almost brand new. And I would say that all of us are doing about the same type of maintenance schedule. We've had, um, We've had some friends have issues, but those haven't been because of the production process itself. It's been because of maybe something that's happened to the boat, maybe from a previous owner or from the current owner. Uh, and that's, that's a conditional type thing. You know, we just got, you got to fix that because something happened. But I haven't heard of anything like that's really, really stuck out at me. The one thing there, I mean, there are clearly differences. One is with the steering. So we know, for instance, a lot of the German boats, the steering, and I felt it myself is a lot tighter. So the wheel is a little bit harder to turn versus the Benetos or even the Genoes, the French built boats, they're, it's a little bit looser. Um, and that can, you know, if you're changing boats all the time, if you don't know that, that can maybe mess with you a little bit on if you think the steering system's okay or not. But that's, Generally, at least from what we've experienced, and we're not experts, we don't know everything that's going on, but from what we've experienced, it's been, it's been generally the same. I haven't heard of anything like too crazy, difference-wise. No, no, I really don't yeah. believe so. I think that uh, what happens often with production boats is uh, because the design is so boxy, and I, and I don't say that, I mean, in a, in a bad way. They're boxy because they need to be made cheaply so that we can buy them at an affordable price. So production boats, they're good. Um, but sometimes a lot of small spaces where you would want to maintain, where you would want to clean, where you would want to go check your cables or your pipe, they're just not accessible. Yeah, accessibility is like, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really good point. The On all production boats, I think the problem is accessibility and it's just really hard to get into some places. Uh, some some other boats, they, they've thought that through a little bit more. But when we toured the Beneteau factory, I understood more why that is. And it's, it's part of the process to make boats cheaper and it's how they construct it. So if we want cheap sailboats, big cheap sailboats to go sailing on, we just have to live with it and we can complain about it. But that's, that's how it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm, so, I'm, if Beneteau wasn't here to make affordable boats, we would not be <coughs> here talking about sailboats because we couldn't afford one. Exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. We have some uh, interesting question. OK, first off, apparently GT7. Do you know about GT7? No. OK, so GT7 is the new WD40. Now in the oh, chat, oh, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now in the chat, people are like, "This is this is the shit. This is okay, what you need GT7. to have." Okay, GT7. Okay, GT7. I can't don't endorse know about that it. or not, but we'll give her yeah. a go. All right. Then we have a question that people are actually interested about. Um, if we 
if we ever considered getting a small 3D printer to fix a small plastic stuff and make useful tool. <laughs> it's, it's a clever idea. I have thought hard about 3D printing. I've, see, I've seen, because when Sophie's been talking, I've been looking at some of the chat. Um, I've seen some conversations, and I do agree. It is a boat. There's only so much room. I don't think we have room for 3D printer. And I'm also skeptical to the basic 3D printers of how, uh, how high quality those pieces will last. The, the industrial type 3D printers can do all kinds of stuff. For a long while, I'll throw out one of my business ideas. I had thought about setting up a network in cruiser heavy areas of 3D printers, industrial 3D printers, where companies could send send the part schematics so that if you're you're there in your ML in Fiji and you need a part, instead of it getting shipped there, it could be printed, but not on your boat, it would be printed in a the local wherever. Uh, I think that would be totally awesome. I know the airline industry has looked into that too. I don't think for us 3D printing on a boat would work and I'm so bad with like CAD stuff and it's like, so maybe it will work for some. I know some people use it. Some have the room for a 3D printer. We have enough tools on the boat. I don't need that, <laughs> but sure. Yeah, and someone had a, a really good comment too. Um, you would need to keep the printing machine at a 90 degree yeah, angle, have to like be, keeping it flat. It'd be and pretty level. That's a challenge. That would on be the boat. a challenge. Yeah. Our boat is uh, is always a little uh, tilted to. I think, is it port side or starboard? Yeah, it's on the port it's side. Port We're always side. lisping a little port. We're like always a little, eh? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't no, work no. very well. OK. Um, cool. So Sailing Catching Rays 2 um, asks about the batteries that you disconnected before we left the boat in Curacao. And will that make the bilge pump, uh, will that keep the bilge pumps running? And does it make you nervous to leave it stored in the water? It's not in the water. It's that's a good like... point. It's not <laughs> in the water. So that's why I disconnected the batteries. So we don't have to worry about the bilge pump. Um, I disconnected the batteries just because I'm not there and don't have control. So they're just connected to each other. They will be fine. Uh, so I'm not worried really about anything other than the fact it's the first time I've done it. So there's always, some question marks, but it, sh it should be fine. Um, we were getting a little water in our bilge because I overfilled some of the water tanks before we left. I don't know if that, all that's out of there. So having the bilge pump connected just to have a crew come in and empty out what's left maybe would be beneficial, but. Mm. Um, yeah, our boat is about to get a good shower. Uh, I think it's gotten a few good showers, but yeah. So uh, no, not not so worried about that. I was talking about yeah, Gonzalo. I know, I know, but it's not a it's not even a storm main storm anymore. Oh, really? No, it's just like... Oh, I, I forgot. I didn't just see rain. that. just rain. All right. Um, here's a question unrelated to maintenance, but still interesting. Um, yeah, talking about that, we've been live for one and a half hours. We were trying to keep We were trying to keep it shorter. Shorter. Yeah. We failed. Sorry, guys. But I think we can just stay. Like, if you guys have questions, we'll stay until... I think if you have questions, like, it's a really good time now to, like, type them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll try to wrap it up here in a little we bit. We can but. even take a few unrelated ones. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so at least ask, boat prices have sort of come down due to this pandemic. Would you take this an, as an opportunity to upgrade uh, or maintenance-wise buy some expensive items that are now ch at cheaper price for future use? Um, so the thing with this pandemic and the reason why it could be an opportunity to upgrade is because people need to sell their sailboats because economically they can't afford them anymore. And uh, we have not been spared by the economical hit. Um, and the fact that we had to uh, go back to Stockholm for a little bit uh, to spend hurricane season uh, in a place where we feel is uh, safe and we don't have to stress about, you know, all those little hurricanes forming in the Atlantic. Uh, it's, uh, it's been more expensive, so we would love to upgrade. Um, we're talking about catamarans. Catamarans are definitely something that we look at, but we just don't have the budget right now. So yeah, as much as we would love to upgrade, uh, it's not something that is going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Unless we win, we win the lottery, but we don't play. I play. You don't win if you don't play. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the boat prices. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think that I... We're just going to stick with our schedule. I think the boat price thing right now, 
you have a group of people that can't afford the boats anymore and you have a group of people that really want boats because they can't go on their other vacations. So I don't know what's really happening with the prices, but we're not so concerned with that. We have a boat. We, as many of you know, we're, we are very interested in upgrading our boat, but we just don't have the funds for that right now. So we're gonna stick with our boat. She's a really good boat for now. Uh, and it's not gonna be till we get to a place financially that we go to a much different and bigger boat uh, that we do that. So for now, I think we're happy. Uh, we've put a lot of heart and soul into Polar Seal and we're really happy where she's at, so. Yeah. Um, Sonia asks, what parts component do we tend to keep multiples of? Yeah, uh, I, like, so I always keep, when we go offshore, I always keep enough, on the engine side, I keep enough for three oil changes. So that's three, um, three buckets for the oil itself, filters and, well, yeah, and filters, uh, and then some extra impellers. And the reason for that is if, first off, like when we had our diesel bug offshore, we needed to be able to charge the engine, or sorry, charge the batteries. And so we were constantly going through filters. So we, we had enough filters to do that. If we would have just had like one, we would have, it would have been a big mess for us. Um, and then also, if by chance you do get water that comes in through the exhaust and into the engine and floods it, uh, you need to have a way to get that seawater out. So you need to flush um, flush the engine and change the oil a couple times before you know that it's all out of there. So I, that's that's the philosophy I've used. I just keep enough for three and it's, it's a lot, but it's there uh, and it's useful. I carry a number of different just nuts and bolts and, that's, and screws find it super super useful because of all different sizes and shapes because you just never know um, and then just some random blocks and stuff so that's all multiples uh, and some basic electrical stuff that's what i'd say i keep multiples of also some of the running rigging um, we don't really have it on the boat because we broke a line but i would keep probably a 10 or 12 for our boat 10 or 12 millimeter line which is the longest of any line on the boat and that way if something does break you have a spare but again that's all for like going offshore if you're just coastal or day sailing you don't really need to keep that because you're more than likely going to be in harbor but what we've been doing for the last 18 months uh, has taken us offshore uh, or at least you know a couple of days away for quite a quite a number of times so we've just been prepared for that yeah. all right <clears throat> so we have a few questions coming in um one of them we you can talk about we and then we can do a rapid oh hold fire. on hold on sorry i so yes and the other uh, jules jules just corrected me uh you also what? have to keep multiple fishing lures <laughs> because we tend to lose those <laughs> and actually in our boat because we're doing all this filming We've had to. We've had a really hard year this year with camera equipment and computers, and as, computers. as you guys know. Everything but has broken we've down. We've had a massive, massive. This <laughs> it was. It was a mainly road we've lost two, this year. Two GoPros. We, your big camera broke. Computer broke. We lost. We almost lost the drone, but we saved it. But the battery fell into the ocean. But that's the cheap part to replace. Yeah. Then what else did we have? My, I had a hard, a five terabyte, uh, five terabyte rugged hard, drive hard drives crash. worth uh, 300 bucks crashing. But we don't carry a lot of camera spares. But yes, Jules is right, fishing lures, because we did lose a lot of those. <laughs> so, anyways. All uh, right, JC wants to know what size cable is our windless cable and how long is the run one way or two way? Yeah, so for electric wiring, you need to know the distance all the way around the circuit. So from start around back to start. And on our boat, it's 12 meters and pretty much our batteries are at the back and the windlass is at the front. So you can just calculate it as 24 meters. And it's 1500 watts. So that's the maximum it's gonna use at 12 volts, a little more than 12 volts. So you can do the math there. Um, and I think the cabling is I don't actually remember off the top of my head, but it's fairly it's fairly big. I mean, thirty to thirty to fifty millimeters squared, um, which is is big. Uh, so, the bigger that windlass is, now of course you could use a twenty four volt windlass, and then you'd have to have some type of way to convert the voltage, but uh, and that would allow you to have pretty much half the wire size. So that's what we're using on the windlass. It's factory. It's what 
came on the factory, but it, we did check it before we used it. So, yep. All right. So uh, I think that we're going to wrap it up, and we're going to wrap it up with a, a rapid fire of uh, a few questions. Oh, we're going to do rapid fire. We're going to do rapid fire. This is a new one. OK, okay. rapid fire. Rapid fire. Uh, <laughs> wait, I have to add this new one. What I'm doing <laughs> is that I'm, copy I'm copying the questions and putting them in a list of questions. OK, okay well. No. Right, if, you're, if you put in some more, and I can do a few housekeeping things while you're trying to find some more. Uh, no, it's good. Okay. We're, uh, I'm Rapid good. fire first. Okay, so no dehumidifier running while we are away. No, maybe we should have, but we didn't because I don't think in the storage yard we're in there allowed the boats to stay connected, and I would have had to keep the batteries connected. So no dehumidifier. We wiped everything down with uh, vinegar before we left. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that works. Hopefully that works. Or we're going to have a uh, mess. Aline asks if you have a recommended list of tools. We do. I have made it since we first talked about buying a boat. We're going to get it on the website. We've had a lot of things, but we're going to get it on there for you guys. I think it's a pretty comprehensive list, so yeah. Okay, this one I will take. What are we doing until November? Uh, we're working. So we're really, we're, we're working our butts off. You are working with your company. Yep. You have taken some more consultancy uh, missions. We're doing these lives, which are fun, but also I'm, take a bit of time. I'm editing, or should I say I'm trying to edit because I've just realized that all of my footage from January, February, and March, because the camera was broken and the microphone port of the camera was broken, all of the footage, all of the footage sounds like <sighs> It's not very good. All the time. So um, I'm trying to come up with uh, creative solutions to, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm also working because we need to, uh, we need to pay the bills. So yeah, we, we're working a lot. And hopefully when we come back in November, we have the cruising kitty a little fuller and we can go on more fun adventures. Do we plan to visit the Sea of Cortez in the future? I don't know. We were just having a discussion about that before the live. We we are going to do some planning in the next few weeks on what our next adventure is going to be and where we're going to go. So I don't think we can answer that right now. No. What is our favorite beer? What's yours? Oh, man. We've gotten really into... Uh, into so, what? So the thing is, is that... What are you? It's, it's rapid fire, right? I know, you're but the thing fire. I know, but the thing is, is that when you're out cruising, as many of you know, like if you're not careful, you end up drinking too much because everybody, you hey, come aboard, have a beer, blah blah blah. So Sophie and I realized that pretty early, and I'm not a big drinker anyway. So we started getting into low alcohol, no alcohol beers. Yeah. To save our livers and like make sure that we don't go to meetings. Jules knows all about that. Yeah, but we found some really good ones. So my my favorite is the what's the the French one um, that we got at, we get at the car for the that tastes kind of like Sprite. Oh, the grapefruit. No, 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 no. Uh, I have no the, idea. Oh, the panache. 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 It's French. Panache. Uh, what's yours? Uh, Jules says grog. That's not a beer, I though. Approve. That's like, no, that's I like also, motor oil. I am, I am also into, um, into alcohol-free beer. Okay, average age of cruisers. Average age of cruisers. It's not ours. It's not ours. Age. Uh, we, do, we do see. You know, though, during the lockdown, we, we were with a big chunk of younger cruisers, though. We just kind of happened to all gravitate towards each other, and we didn't notice it. Um, I don't know. There's a question about I would this on say cruiser around, farm. I would, say, I would say around 50. 50. Yeah, I would say around 50. Yeah, that's 50. probably right. In that age. Yeah. Okay, that's, that one is for you, Ryan. Why have you not got Sophie a puppy yet? <sighs> Sophie's birthday is on Tuesday. You never know. <laughs> no, uh, we're talking... Don't create expectations uh, now, just, because I'm going to quote you on there's that. There's not going to be a, a, a um, puppy on Tuesday. Um, no, I, we've talked about a puppy. I think we're going to get a puppy soon, but we just need to figure out some last sailing plans, and we'll see. Why do I have to be the one that gets the puppy? I think that I would probably Sophie's be the one gonna getting be the puppy. I don't know anything about dogs. If I got a dog, I'd come home with a big pony. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> All right. All right, and uh, let's see here. But I think that's going to wrap up. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, no, there is a good, uh, an interesting discussion in uh, the chat about how prices, boat prices have actually 
increased yeah. during COVID. And that has been my impression as well, that everybody wants to be on boats right now, especially in Sweden. Everybody, the boat market is hot. Um, yeah, if you're selling a boat, I think it's a good time. But I, who knows? But we don't want to get rid of our boat yet. So, yeah. Um, good. Well, anything else you think? No, I think if that's there's it. Other, if there's other questions, we can take them, take them later. Or you can put it in the comments section below and we can answer them when we see them. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. Well, I hope that you guys got something out of this maintenance live. Uh, for us, it's, it's always interesting to hear other people's stories and whatnot. If you find these live sessions useful, uh, as always, they're free to you guys. But um, if you do find them useful, you find value in, in them. There's always the super chat online that you can donate or give a little bit of money to or on our website there's a paypal link uh if if you feel like it's worth worth it uh just to kick a little money back to us it's really appreciated uh what else the next live we haven't decided what we're going to do so we're looking for ideas yes ryan oh, is lacking oh. ryan is lacking a little bit of inspiration we have some ideas but one thing that i'm going to put sophie on the spot here a little bit is that i think it would be really fun if sophie did a technical live what would that be about? And I have some ideas, but uh, Sophie's got some really good skills with things on the boat, and I think it would be fun if she she did it live. I mean, what technical skills? I know you don't like. I know do you I not... have that people would but want. But you to... got some. You got some. I'm just saying, you've got some specialties. So maybe some some people have some ideas on that. So that's um, we're looking for some inspiration on the lives. We love to keep doing these. Uh, we have a few ideas, but we're looking for some more. So we're going to talk about boat, boat in interior decor. Yeah, you could do that or some hair thing. I don't no, know. No, no, that's that, that's that feels very uh, fishing. I just saw. Now that's an idea. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, fishing. I'm cooking I'm is just, coming up. I'm uh, not an expert, and also cooking. I feel really bad when it comes to cooking because I'm working so hard to get a little cookbook of our Atlantic recipes, but every time that I'm working on it, some, something seems to pop up. I, I feel really bad about it, but um, anyways. Uh, well, we're getting some ideas, so I, I, that's really great. <gasps> I have an idea. We could do boat shopping. I know that Andy did that, but uh, boat shopping would be, would be fun. We kind of did. We kind of did that already. Yeah, but like, look at look at listings well, and dream a little bit. I don't know. Anyways, so kick us some ideas. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, we do appreciate you guys taking your time on Sundays to join us. It's awesome. Uh, the last bit, I already said it. Sophie's birthday is no, um, on. It's on Tuesday, they, and I really uh, have to give a shout out for Sophie's birthday. It's super awesome. It's, I enjoy having being a partner with Sophie on this big project. Oh. And so big happy birthday to Sophie. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's Yay, good. getting older. <laughs> <laughs> Always fun. So we'll do another one of these, uh, n not next Sunday, we'll do it two weeks, Sunday after, as long as we get some cool ideas from you guys uh, and we'll figure out what that is. Yay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's uh, it's so much fun to uh, to hang out with you. Today, there was a little less people than usual, still a lot. I think a lot, yeah. But uh, it's fun because it keeps it a little like more intimate, and we really have time to chat and answer the questions. So it's, uh, it's super cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you very soon. Uh, and uh, have, a, have a great day, wherever in the world you are. See ya. Bye. <laughs>